There you go. Scripture reading today is in Matthew 16, 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, Whom do you say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh or blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So be it. start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, for you are a wonderful, mighty God, deserving of all praise, glory, and honor. Lord, sometimes we get distracted by the things of this world, but let us remember that you created us for your purpose, for your glory, to, to make you known to this world. And Lord, we thank you that when we sinned against you, that you decided not to take your wrath upon us, but you knew already that your plan was to send your one and only Son to die for our sins. Lord, help us to serve King Jesus with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. And Lord, just help us to be a light in this world. We just thank you and praise you. Open up our hearts and minds today to hear your words and apply them to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue on with Acts chapter 5, but if, I, if you remember what I told you last week, I said if you wanted to do homework, you could go back and read Luke chapter 10, 11, and 12, because I kept going back to Jesus' words all throughout his ministry, but I kept going back to those, especially with what I saw going on in the church now. And we finished off in Acts chapter 5, verse 11, where we read, Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Fear, phobia, to be afraid of something. And Great fear sees the whole church, the ecclesia, those that are called out, called out of this world to be a light to this world, a group of people, a body of people, those called out on mission, those who have a purpose, a purpose that was different from what it was before, a mission that Jesus gave them until he returned, a mission that there's no way that they could do unless they let the Holy Spirit lead and guide them. So I'm going to go into Luke 12 before we get to Acts 5 again and start reading in Luke chapter 12. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now think about that as you're getting to Acts chapter 5 and the religious leaders and how they were hypocrites. But also, what would you label? And I know don't label. I'm not saying label people. But what do you think about Ananias and Sapphira? Were they wearing a mask? Were they playing games? Were they sold out? Did they just let Satan creep into their hearts? I don't have the right answer. And like I said, I'm not labeling anybody. But something, Peter addressed that. He said, how could you let Satan creep in like that? And Satan has no power, no authority, anything else. What would cause you to do that? when you've got such a great salvation. Be on your guard, defensive, taking up the gear that you need to take up to defend because we fight a spiritual battle. And the first thing that he says we fight a spiritual battle against is the yeast that spreads everywhere. We don't even know how it happens or anything. The yeast of who? The Pharisees, who should be the religious leaders, the the ones that can see leading others to the light, not the blind leading the blind. And they're, the yeast that they're spreading is hypocrisy. 
saying I believe in God, saying I'm going to serve Him, saying I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, but yet not because my heart is not there. And I might not know your heart. <laughs> I might not even know my own heart sometimes. But God knows your heart. He knows whether you love Him or you love things, as we're going to see here. Verse 2, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. Nothing. Or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. Boy, I think about that verse a lot. <laughs> And the thoughts and the things, and you know, forgive me, Father. What you said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What have you whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. God knows everything. So then in verse 4, you get this, I tell you, and you'll see that several more times. Listen up. I'm going to tell you this. My friends, do not be afraid. We've got that same word, phobo. phobo. Uh, do not be afraid of what? Those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. So the first thing that, that Jesus tells us to not be afraid of is man. What all the implications that puts in your mind. But instead, the opposite of that is fear God. Well, we know about Jesus Christ. We know about His love for us. So we don't have that fear of condemnation. We are His own child. But we still have a reverent awe, fear that we never need to forget whatsoever. And guys, we're kind of lax in this day and age. Plain and simple. I'll say it. That reverent fear we have for God Almighty who has created everything, including our lives, which so many times... We take our lives and say, God, what do you want with this part instead of living as a living sacrifice? Everything to God be the glory. I'll show you who you should fear. Fear him who after the body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, Jesus repeats it again. Listen up. Fear him. If you fear God, Scripture says that's the beginning of wisdom. If you fear God, you're going to be motivated to be a holy, righteous people. If you fear God, you're going to have reverent awe to do the things He wants to do. Like a father, because you know Him as your heavenly Father. And because of the Spirit, you can cry out in prayer as Jesus did, Abba, Father. I don't fear my dad for being able to punish me or do this or that to me because there's no condemnation from my dad. But I do fear Him in a respect of reverent awe, and I want to do things that please Him, and I hope my life is pleasing to Him. I hope He's proud of me. I want that because I care what my Father thinks about me, and I do respect Him. How much more am I going to love and respect God who, would, who created everything, and then instead of destroying me, gave His Son's life to save me? <clears throat> then Jesus gives us the example. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Now you might know why they're sold and why they're not sold, but a couple reasons. That was the cheapest thing that a poor man could buy for food. It was the cheapest thing that a poor man could buy to offer to God. Whichever way you want to look at it. To live or to offer up to God. Either one, the choice is yours with what you have in these worlds. Even to the, to the poorest person, remember the widow who gave all she had? Whether you need it for food or you're even willing to give that food away to offer it to God because you know He'll give you more. The poorest thing God cares about and He provides for all. And He even cares about those two little sparrows. Yet not one of them is forgotten. Even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. And as you get older, you know you lose more and more hair every day. That's just a crazy thing. God can know that. And He knows everybody's. <laughs> Constantly changing. That number's changing as we speak. Changing, changing, changing. And God knows it. Think about that. God knows everything. He is in control of everything. He created you and gave you the breath of life. And even when you disobeyed, He still loved you. Loves you. And He gave His Son to die for you. And Jesus has called you out to be a different people, to be a holy people. We look at Paul's words and everything and to look at the examples of the Israelites. And you've been given authority from Jesus who has all authority and you've been given power. And he even says greater things you'll do. So this is the church that we're seeing in Acts chapter 4 and that we're seeing in Acts chapter 5 also. 
<clears throat> Don't be afraid. Jesus says it again. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, so listen up again. I've, he said and repeated, really repeated. Don't be afraid of the things of this world, but be afraid of God. But yet we know that we don't have to be afraid of condemnation because of what Christ has done for us. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, there's your mission to acknowledge Jesus Christ, what he's done for you, God's love for you, who you follow now instead of the, uh, this other master, how you live your life, why you lo live differently, why you love God and you love others, even your enemies. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And I, you know, sometimes I think, well, I don't disown Jesus. I'm never guilty of that. But if you look in contrast, if I'm not proclaiming what he's done for me, I'm denying it. Whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. I always say when I get to this verse, we could spend a long time debating that verse. But if the Spirit leads you to do something, listen, obey. Walk in step by the Spirit. Don't worry about what all this means, except that it is God living in me, speaking to me, revealing the things of Jesus, guiding me into all truth, giving me the words to say when I don't know what to say, giving me the prayers I need to pray when I don't know how to pray. Why would I not want to listen to the Spirit and walk in step with the Spirit? Verse 11, when you're brought before the synagogues, we've already seen this, Peter and John were taken before the synagogues because what they did with a miracle of healing a man, an act of kindness, of which they didn't worry about money because they didn't have any. They gave them what they did have. They gave them Jesus. And then the man began to proclaim, even if you read that passage, it looks like the man has been arrested with them because he's there with them because the, the, the religious leaders say, what can we do? The man's here. The persecution comes. So when you're brought before the synagogues, the rulers and authorities, do not worry. That's a different word there. It's, and I'm not good at my pronunciation or pronouncing, however you want to say it, of Greek, but we're going to go with it. Mary Nahaho. I don't know how good I did or not. It's to not take that point so far that you begin to worry about it. There's a difference in concerned. What am I going to eat today? Well, we don't have to really worry about that because we've got so many choices. But if you didn't have anything and you only had enough money for two sparrows, you kind of worry about it. But do you get to this point where you're concerned about it enough that it affects your behavior, what you do, what you think? Oh, what am I going to do after these two sparrows? Uh, how am I going to make ends meet? How am I going to provide for my children? It's, it's going past that where you're acting upon that fear. And as we read this scripture, there's this passage, there's another word that goes even further that we then create doubt because that worry has led to doubt. And we'll get to that in a minute. So Jesus says, basically, and your, your translations may say different, he says, take no worry. None whatsoever. Don't take it up. No worry whatsoever because you don't need to. He's already explained to you how loved you are, how much God loves you. So take no worry about what? how you will defend yourself or what you will say. Oh, we've gone from proclaiming him to being locked up for proclaiming him, which we've already seen in Acts chapter 3, and we're going to read again in Acts chapter 5. Okay? But don't fear what men can do to you. Fear God and fear him alone. <clears throat> for the Holy Spirit, verse 12, will teach you at that time what you should say. And if you remember from Scripture, we saw the filling of the Holy Spirit. Luke specifically wrote it that the Holy Spirit filled Peter and he began to speak to the religious leaders. But at that point, someone in the crowd wasn't listening. I'm just going to go like this, you know. Someone in the crowd said, Teacher, 
Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Wow. These things that Jesus is teaching profoundly to us, teaching us about this new life that we can experience and everything else. And then somebody says, hey, 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 wait a minute. I'm still concerned about money issues here. That you can't serve both God and money. You'll love one, despise the other, right? I mean, that's what Jesus says. Oh, was that some of the motivation for Ananias? Huh. So we're seeing real life events of what Jesus taught right here. And if we look, we can see these real life events in our own lives. Let's be honest. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. He's already said several times, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. And at the beginning he said, Be on your guard. Now he says, Watch out. Be on your guard. We put two things together. I've already told you to suit up and everything else, and maybe you're suited up, but you're not paying attention. You're getting slack, and you're standing around talking with all your armor on and everything, but the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? I think a de uh, when a lion seeks to devour something, he, he seeks to eat it up and destroy it. Be on your guard. Keep on constant watch against all kinds of greeds. Life does not consist of, of an abundance of possessions. You've got to change that mindset. You've got to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you've been, been given a mission to actually introduce people and to bring them into the kingdom of heaven. So then verse 16, he told them this parable. And you know what a parable is. It's a further teaching illustration. But if I don't have the first concepts down, I'm not really going to understand the further teaching, even if it's a common thing that I'm familiar with. That was a good story. I'm familiar with it. But I don't take it and apply it. And we've heard this parable so many times. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger, one, build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. <coughs> Eat, drink, and be merry. Now let me point it out. <coughs> Let's see, where's God in that? He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns, build myself bigger barns, and there I will store my surplus grain. I'll say to myself, I have plenty of grain. I will take life easy. I will eat. I will drink. I will be merry. Do you see God in there anywhere? But how many times do we do that, not even thinking that we do it because we just go about the normal things of life and then, oh, God, um, let me put you in here. When Jesus starts it off that God is the reason for everything and Jesus is the reason that you will not perish but have eternal life if you believe in him. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. You don't say those words. Grandma bust you if you say call somebody a fool you fool you are lacking of all common sense knowledge enough to function you fool this very night your life will be demanded from you then you will get what you have prepared for yourself because you have the choice of what to do that choice was there for Ananias and Sapphira and that life was required of them you see what Jesus taught? And you know that the, the church heard these words, and you know when they heard these words that fear came upon them. That if I'm going to say I'm a Christian, I better mean it. Because what greater gift could anyone ever have than Jesus paying the debt for your sin so that you could live? And Scripture tells clearly, His teachings tell clearly that that's not just eternal life, that's to live for King Jesus now. You don't get do-overs, anything else. 
Verse 21, I've got this one highlighted. <laughs> that is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. It doesn't mean go sell everything, go to the foreign mission field, but I would encourage you again to look at the letters that I've sent to Beth there. Things are changing drastically over there. They're due to COVID. That you have a different curfew if you've been vaccinated, not been vaccinated. But there's a major oppression coming on by the government to control them. And Beth said when she started however many years ago, and she's given her life to that, that the education rate of children was 1% got an education. She says it's up to about 70% now, but the schools are shut down right now. Where do you think it's going to be next year if they get an opportunity to go? And they're already considered the least of these. Maybe they want to keep them oppressed. The government, the authorities, the powers, I don't know. But it's on my heart and I pray. And because it's hard to travel, they're not getting as many volunteer missionaries coming short term. And Lee, the, the founder, just had a heart attack. Beth's getting up in age and dealing with more and more health concerns and thinking, what am I going to do for my retirement? Looks like things are falling down around here. We fight a spiritual battle. I think, I think it started out with be on guard. I don't know. I, my heart just breaks for her. And she said probably out of full-time people that they'll be down to her and, and Lee come the first of the year. Now, we've got to walk by faith, not by sight. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm praying for her and doing what I can other than that without being there. Verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, therefore means I'm tying everything that I started saying to you when it started in verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd was there, he looked at his disciples and spoke to them first because it would go one in, in one ear and out of the crowd, but his disciples, listen. So he says to his disciples, I tell you again, so that means listen up, do not worry. Now what do I need to not worry about? Your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you'll wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Life. Your essence, your soul, your spirit, however you want to describe that, and your body are more than the things that you see. They were God created to bring Him glory and to even more tell of Jesus' sacrifice for you, God's love for you. <clears throat> Consider the ravens. Luke uses that word. You might know it from Matthew where he says, Consider the birds. It's a different word. Luke, remember, he's a doctor. He's analytical. He uses words specifically. He puts them in order specifically. And he uses ravens. And remember that God's word is inspired, every word of it. So Luke didn't change that word from birds to ravens unless the Holy Spirit inspired him to do it. So he's got a point for making it here. Consider the ravens. And maybe Jesus taught it one time with birds and one time with ravens. We don't know, but we know this is inspired. Luke wrote ravens, and you'll only find it here. And what did he say to do? Consider the ravens. I've been studying about ravens all week. <laughs> I've been reading in scripture about ravens all week. You know, ravens are one of the smartest animals we know. Their intelligence is up there with dolphins, maybe even exceeding dolphins. Their communication skills that they have, they can mimic a hundred different types of sounds. One being human speech. They can do, imitate more human speech than parrots. They don't get any credit for anything. Maybe it's because they're con considered dark because that's the way things have pointed them out to. They're unclean as far as the Bible goes, but yet they fed Elijah when the drought was coming on. God used them to feed Elijah. Yeah, they'll be the ones that pick the eyeballs out of human beings' flesh. Sorry. <laughs> They're omnivores. They eat all kind of things. They eat whatever. When they go to eat ants, they take a stick, put it in their beak, and dig the ants out. 
smash the ants on their body. Don't know what they're getting out of that. There's, there's all kind of ideas there, but mostly they think they're doing it for the toxin or whatever's on it to protect them and help their, their coat, their feathers, who knows? And then they eat them. They can call other birds over with different kind of calls and they can point. I said they can mimic human beings. When they find a wolf or coyote carcass, they come to it and they call in for reinforcements and many times run the wolf even off of his own carcass. When other wolves come around, they will imitate the sound of a wolf to keep other wolves from coming around. Crazy. <laughs> Consider the ravens. Huh. Well, let's see what he talks about here. They do not sow or reap, because maybe I'm going way beyond considering them, but <laughs> they don't sow or reap. <clears throat> they have no storeroom or barn. Okay, he talked about a barn with the, with the rich fool. Yet God feeds them. Hmm. And how much more valuable are you, are you than birds? We've already discussed that, and now we've got the raven in here. Who of you then, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little, little thing, why do you worry about the rest then? If God's in control of your life and he feeds you and you're valuable to him, why are you worried about to the point, because he's already changed the words around, from worry coming into I, I contemplate and ponder on these things. Okay? So also consider how the wildflowers grow. Ones that aren't planted, ones that don't have weed process growing, fertilizer, anything else. God just plants them. They don't labor or spend. They don't have to go to and fro to find their food. God just takes care of them. Yet I tell you, so compare this, not even Solomon, richest and wisest man, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Oh, and when I consider the wildflowers, they only have one season to bring God glory and honor, don't they? And they grow to maturity and splendor during that one season to bring God glory and honor. Hmm. Verse 29, and do not set your heart, maybe yours has seek, because seek goes better with the next words. Do not seek on what you'll eat or drink. Do not even worry about it. Now we've got a different word. It's meto -rizomai. And it means don't worry to the point that you put your hope into this, that it confuses you, that you swell up with pride. So you see this progression that's going along. Because now I'm going to live for those things instead of living for God. Or I'm going to be scared of losing those things so I won't be rich for God. Who knows what would have happened if the rich man would have taken the things out of his barn and sold them all and gave them. Or sold part of them and gave them if his heart was right. I don't think his life would have been required that night. I don't think he would have been labeled as a fool by God. That's just how I'm reading into it. But he did nothing to be rich towards God. He did everything to build up treasure for himself where moths will come in and destroy it and where thieves will come in and steal it. <clears throat> do not set your hearts or do not seek on what you'll eat or drink. Do not worry about it. Verse 30, for that's what the pagan world, and it simply means people or, na or nations, not necessarily ungodly, the ways of the world. They run after such things simply because they don't know better. They don't know Jesus Christ yet. You're to point out the light. There are plenty of good, good people out there in the world, but without Jesus, good doesn't get you to heaven, contrary to what some people think. You still die and you still go to hell apart from God because you can only be saved by, your blood, by the blood of Jesus Christ and your faith in what, who he is and what he's done for you. For the Father knows that you need them. But instead, seek, same word that was used before, his kingdom. And when you do that, these things will be given to you as well. Now I could go to Matthew 6 and look, because you've seen so many things that's in the Sermon on the Mount there. And I've been all over there, but I'll, for time's sake I won't go there today. 
Sell your, excuse me, 32. Do not be afraid. There we've got again, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. There it is again. Maybe that was their motivation. And again, because I don't want to preach and teach that thing where well, he said, go do all this. I didn't say to do anything. <laughs> I'm just telling you what Jesus said. And I will add this to it in my thoughts. If possessions are what's keeping you from serving Jesus, then you should sell them. If you're not rich for God, you need to get rich for God. But there's no, pro no problem with being rich either. There are plenty of examples of that in the Bible which were godly men. But don't let riches be your heart's affection, which is going to go to here in just a second. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out then. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, here we go, there your heart will be. There's the focus. Where is your heart? It's not about money or things. It's about where your heart is. Where was Ananias and Sapphira's heart? They were posers. They were hypocrites. They were actors putting on a mask. They were not sold out for Jesus, and that day their life was required. Verse 35, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, you can immediately open the door for him. The church that Jesus built, you probably know it. The word is ecclesia. It's used two times in the gospels. They're both in Matthew. They're said by Jesus Matthew 16, 18 says, Jesus will build his church. And he says it will start with Peter, exactly what we see in Acts. In Matthew 18, we're dealing with sin in the church already. And Jesus says, if the brother sins against you, here's what you need to do. And then we see it again in Acts 2, the Lord added to the church those the number were being saved up until the point where hypocrisy raised its ugly head and God dealt with it over issues of things, concerns of this world, rather than concerns for building the kingdom of God, being devoted to Jesus Christ. In Acts 2, I'll remind you what Peter said. He said in verse 40, with many other words he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And we see more adding to that number. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, that's the same word phobos, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number, the church, daily those who were being saved. That's the Ecclesia word in verse 47 where this says added to their number. We see the same thing in Acts chapter 4 except maybe it's growing like that flower in splendor, growing in beauty, the church is, until this needs to be dealt with, this hypocrisy in the church before it spreads. The Acts 4 church looks the same as Acts 2, Acts 2, except maybe, like I said, it's even getting more beautiful. And the world's seeing it even more. And then in Acts chapter 5, verse 5 and verse 12, we see that great... Megaphobus came upon the people. It's a noun where the other used was a verb. 1 Peter 1.17 says, Since you call on the Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
1 John 4, 8, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, where you don't worry about anything but loving the Lord and loving others. It drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. There's three different New Testament authors and what they say about fearing the Lord. Let's go back to the Old Testament a minute. Deuteronomy 5, 29, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and to keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. And then Jesus <laughs> said in Matthew 15, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then the next verse says, they worship me in vain. Where is your heart? That's where we're at. If you want some homework this week, go read, and I probably won't go there next week, but go read Deuteronomy 5 through 8 and look at the holy standards that God put on His people. He demands our holiness so that we're not hypocrites, so that we're not drawn our hearts and affections to other gods, other idols, so that we can love instead of hating and stealing and coveting. Fear of God gripped the church. Here we are to verse 12 of Acts chapter 5. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers met together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them. They were scared. Even though they were highly regarded among the people. They didn't want to just sign up for church because of the programs, because of the things that were going on there, because they knew signing up for church meant... I better be serious about it. They, they weren't going to be a faker or a hypocrite. Fear of God was there. Verse 14, no, Nevertheless, though, more and more men and women did believe in the Lord and were added to their number. Genuine believers. More workers for the kingdom. Don't you think the church was play, praying for workers because the harvest was great, but the workers were few? Verse 15, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on them as he passed. Now, we don't know that Peter's shadow healed anyone, but we do know that a woman touched Jesus' garment. We do know that Paul's handkerchief did heal. Scripture tells us that. So we've gone from that wildflower just growing to this just glorious thing and would it have been possible if God didn't stamp out the hypocrisy? I hope he doesn't stamp out the hypocrisy in a church, and then at the same time, I hope he does stamp out the hypocrisy in the church. But guess what? We have every time to look at it ourselves like the rich fool did and say, hey, am I a hypocrite? Where is my heart? Ananias and Sapphira had the same time to do that. Peter said, how did you let Satan fill your heart? The money was yours. You did not have to come to this deceptive action that you did because your heart was far from God. Why in the world would you think of lying to God, lying to the Holy Spirit? You're not lying to men. You're lying to Him with your hypocrisy. Men may not see it, but as this scripture started in Luke 12, everything will be revealed. For God knows and He searches after the one whose heart is focused and devoted to Him. Then verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. What a glorious, glorious picture of the church. The mission that they had, wiped clear of hypo hypo hypocrisy. And I'll say it again, if you signed up for the church on that day, you knew what you were signing up for and your heart was devoted for it. Does that mean that you didn't waver anything? No, that's why they constantly had to pray and, and search God's words and listen to the apostles teaching and everything else because they knew they were fighting a battle. They had to be on guard. But they knew they were signing up saying, I will deny myself. I will take up my cross because persecution's coming and I will follow Jesus no matter the cost. There's a song we, we planned this one today. Debbie and I don't ever plan songs. They just always work out perfect. But we planned that one today. You've heard that song. You know, I'll, I'll, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Well, we're going to pick up 
in verse 17 and 18 next, so you can see the suffering that's coming. Then the high priest and his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. Why would they have jealousy in the first place? That's back to commandment 10 about coveting and everything and where it leads. Do you really believe? What if you face that kind of persecution? What if it costs you? What if it costs you everything? Would you follow Jesus? And I'm sad to say again that I don't think many in the church in this country for sure would really mean that. Consider the ravens. They're smart. They get their omnivores. They go gather food. They do what God designed them to do. Even though they're unclean, Scripture tells us that. They still carry out God's mission to feed His prophets, to pluck the eyeballs out of the flesh. What, who, what kind of bird did Noah send out of the ark? Waiting for an answer. Come on. No wrong answer. What? You know he sent a dove. Come on. You, did you know he sent a raven also? A lot of us miss that. We should study Scripture. What's that, Bob? Oh, Fred, sorry. Yes. We study Scripture to be approved. Man, I've been studying this one. <laughs> and God and I haven't come to an answer yet. But so many commentators are all over the place. And the biggest one you get is, is Noah sent out a raven first because it would have dead bodies to eat off of. I don't agree with that one. They were up Mount Ararat height. Bodies, I'm sorry to go all over this, but bodies go to the to bottom because of lack of oxygen, not because of too much water. Then they might come back up and float. There's never been a case of somebody from the depths of the sea floating to the top. I don't know. Maybe that's it, maybe it's not. There are things that tell that the raven was unclean, so he was purging the un uncleanliness out of the, out of the ark. And God took him on the ark. Think about these things. And salvation is offered to every man. There's even stuff from Jewish scriptures about the raven, because it's considered with spiritual darkness and stuff, confronted Noah about his sins and, and Noah sent him out. Maybe we're thinking things too deep. I don't have the right answer. Maybe it's because he's a clever, powerful bird that will take care of himself much better in flight than the, than the dove is for, for what he's facing. Maybe Noah thought that he might find bodies, whatever. What about the, if the raven didn't come back? How would he mate and we'd still have ravens today? Come on, I'm just asking you questions so you're studying. Because they took seven of each bird, remember? Not two, because see, our minds are on two, okay? And it says from Scripture that the raven went to and fro. Most of your commentator says that means that the raven went and didn't come back. I don't read it that way, and I've studied the words. To and fro. He could have went to and fro from the ark and found rest. He might not ever came in the window because the dove came in the window, but that doesn't mean the raven didn't. Okay? Um, maybe, but it says he went to and fro until the water dried up. So how did Noah know he went to and fro till the water drew, dr dried up unless he saw the raven again? Okay, but the raven is a symbol of uncleanness. It's a, it's a symbol of how we're going to go about our life functioning like normal, and God is going to take care of us. He's going to feed and clothe us. Sorry, whether you put your faith into him or not. He loves the righteous and the unrighteous. That's why Jesus Christ died for all. But then later Noah sent out the dove. And the first time he came back empty-handed, the second time the dove came back. And the dove is a representation of the Holy Spirit. He came back with an olive branch, which is a symbol of renewal, growth, peace. Ah, maybe I should quit trying to live my life as the raven without God in it, even though he's supplying all of my needs, this rich fool that I am and live my life empowered by the Holy Spirit who brings me new life, life that Jesus wanted me to have, abundant life that brings peace and joy, and I can even bring it into others who are even in the ark that are safe, that I can teach God's children to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like we see the Acts Church living. I don't know. Like I said, I've been... with this consider the raven thing 
all week. There's no right or wrong answer, but that's where God pointed me in the direction of considering the raven. They don't sow or reap. They have no store, storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And we'll go back to the words before Jesus said to consider the ravens. Therefore, summing up everything he did before, I tell you again, don't worry about your life. What you'll eat. Don't worry about your body. What you'll wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Wow. Jesus wants us to live for him. And so many times we get distracted along the way going to and fro. Hmm. Consider the wildflowers. After you've considered these things, how much more will God clothe you? You of little faith. Oh, Father, increase my faith so that I can be bold like Barnabas was bold, so that I can be an example, that I can be encouraging even to the disciples, even to Saul, Paul coming up. Even though I, means it, it must, I must decrease so that Paul can increase and carry the gospel more. Just like John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that Jesus must increase. Increase my faith. Help me not to seek after, let alone worry about or anything else, the things of this world, but help me to seek God's kingdom instead. So I've got a video coming up for you. It talks about the story, and then I think Debbie's going to close with this song.